All righty, Peter. It's uh, we we made the announcement. We put it out there. It's gotten a fair amount of love. Who who knew that people wanted to listen to you and I after this couple of years off? I thought they were happy when you and I, well, at least when they got rid of me finally. Uh, <laughs> uh, how are you, my friend? I'm fine, thank you. Uh, oh, end of the new year, uh, bright and cheery, and all the rest of it. Bright and cheery things we Bright don't hear. Cheery. No, I'll leave that alone. Uh, you met. You mentioned obviously we're into the new year, so uh, we get. Uh, we're we're recording this just as the new year flips. So World Juniors just uh, just on the the tail end of things, getting into the interesting part there. Well, we've yeah. got a we've got an interesting show coming up for that. So we'll we'll, we'll leave everybody with a little bit of a teaser there. Um, yeah. But uh, we've got that NHL camps are starting up. Uh, mm-hmm. We've got uh, we got an NHL season that's actually going to apparently happen um, coming up here in the middle of the month uh how are you feeling about uh you know the, the hockey are you getting that a good hockey vibe going no not yet N- mm-hmm. not yet I, I i wish i could but i can't uh because there's been there's been so many delays and and, and transfers and one thing and another that i really can't when they get on the ice with the pucks uh then then i'll get excited yeah, exactly. It's it's a it's a little bit uh, a little bit interesting for the NHL. For I know I pulled up uh, I pulled up my Twitter feed this morning, and uh, you know I, I would be lying if you look at my background. You probably can figure out which team I was looking at on their Twitter account. Uh, so they kind of uh, they post a you know a video of uh, guys on the ice and shooting mm-hmm. pucks and all that sort of thing. So we'll be interested to see that aspect. But yeah. As- it, 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 it takes a while, especially for you, I'm sure, getting used to hockey. The NHL starting in January is probably January. a little different for you, obviously. No, yeah, it's not it late October. It is it's starting in January, as you say. It, it's uh, it's difficult. And, and of course, with junior, uh, you know, I, I, not starting it until February, maybe, uh, then that's even more so. Uh, frustrating, just frustrating. Either way, my friend, uh, we're we're stuck at our homes again here in Ontario for a period of time. So you yeah. know what? If they if they give me something to watch for the midway point of the month, uh, my my wife has joked with me. You know the fact that she's like, how do how do you flip from you know? Well, I'll be watching a World Junior game, then I'll go over and watch the Raptors for a bit, and then <laughs> weekend. Now I now watch college football. So you there know, you go, there you, you go. And you wear the big purple machine for a while, and uh, you, you you wear the the W proudly for a bit. There you uh, are. As just a staff member, uh, yeah. you, you kind of get into the football thing. So it's uh, it's been a flip around situation. But uh, as we mentioned off the top when we did the show, we said we were gonna uh, we're gonna talk a little sports. But then we're gonna we're gonna talk to some friends of the show, and I, I just yeah. call it friends of the Godfather. So, um, you know, when we when we talked about the fact that uh, you know we we got the junior hockey element, we got the sports element, we we had to go to a, a good friend of both of ours to start things out. And uh, you know what? Let's bring him in now. There he is, Chirello, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, wearing wearing the UNB hat proudly. We uh, the uh, the fun part about this, Gino, and I was talking to this about uh, two feet earlier on. And we'll kind of go through the resume as we go. And we know it. if there's any sarcasm to go around, the three of us will take care of it <laughs> promptly. So, um, you know, Gino, uh, first and foremost, thanks for doing this. Yeah. Oh, anytime. A pleasure. Great to see you guys together. And uh, uh, like I said to you earlier, Ryan, uh, great idea to, to, to put something like this together. Yeah, we it was actually. Uh, I'll be you know fully fully honest. I, I brought the idea up to Pete, and I said, Pete, what do you think about doing this? And he said, Yeah, yeah, well, let's think about it. Let's if, if, you know, get some things figured out. My next text message was to Gene, where I said, Gene, is this a good idea? And he said, and I believe it was nothing but you 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 better do this. <laughs> hey, um, Go ahead, uh, it, Gino. Give me give me before I get too far. Give me your best Pete James story. Oh, oh my goodness! I, oh boy, there's no, there's no, there's no bad or embarrassing Pete James stories. Don't worry, Pete. <laughs> no, no, you know what? Just fond memories. I one of the best is uh, sitting around my parents' dining room up in the Sioux, eating uh, salami and drinking vino. You know, <laughs> That's and, right. uh, and another one might be at my wedding where Pete and Mike Stubbs uh, called out the starting lineup uh, out in Centennial Hall. You know, like uh, yeah. cool memories like that. Yeah, that's right. We were, uh, we were, how is Frank, by the way? They're Your doing father. well. They're yeah, doing well. They're, they, they're here with us and uh, part of our bubble. So, uh, oh, they are, right? Eh? Yeah. So oh, great. Yeah, that's they're watching the grandkids. Yeah. 
for the record, for the most part of this show, it'll be Gene and Pete reminiscing, and I'll just sit over here in the corner and laugh the whole time and be perfectly okay with it. So, well, I, I love your uh, your uh, when you were with Ryan on the on the Junior B uh, telecast. They were they were uh, that was fun. That was fun because because you get a chance to reminisce a little bit. If, if you were. It was a, it was a lot of fun. Sometimes we forgot that a hockey game was happening. Yeah. <laughs> we were often reminded of that by uh, by our producer. Yeah, we'd, we'd, we'd go, go up on these sidebars, and, and and you'd hear you'd get it in the ear about guys hockey game, hockey game, hockey game. Yeah. Yeah. At that point, it was nine to one. Nobody yeah, cared. Yeah, who cared? <laughs> and who cared about the final result? The best part was usually we. And the reason we let Gene go on forever was because he was playing weekend hockey with the head coach in the Nationals. So there's usually more f- funnier stories about what Pat did or didn't do at the uh, Sunday Super League there. Um, and uh, basically the fact that Gene would usually uh, stone him. So, uh, you know, we're yeah. good to go that way. Pat was yeah. a competitor. He was, uh, he, we had a, we had a good team and uh, I, I, I had a, sh- a nagging shoulder injury that kept me out for the season after that. But then now that this year has obviously probably been obliterated because of the circumstances, but yeah, yeah. Now, Gino, let's. Uh, I said we'll go through the, the bio. I'm not going to, you know, read it all the way through because you know you'll you'll kill me and you know throw things at me and say <laughs> shut your hip. But um, now we mentioned the Sioux aspect sort of thing. Uh, I always like to ask people, especially you know, who have played sports at every level, sort of thing. When did the the love and the passion for was, was it always just hockey, or was it uh, were there other areas of interest growing up? Because I I have a feeling those Northern Ontario kids have to uh, fill the time for you. Well, there were three of them came down at once. Let's not forget <laughs> that there were three of them, and and they were all very good. Mike Mazuka and uh, Rico Fata. Oh my God, he could fly, and uh, and uh, Gino. They all came down uh, thanks to Don Carrillo, who is this, the uh, Northern Ontario scout for the London Knights back in those days. So Mizuka just called while you guys were doing your intro to the show. And he said he wanted, I told him what I was doing and he wanted me to pass on uh, his greetings to you, Pete. So hello ah. from Mike Mizuka. Hey, big uh, Luke. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, yeah, growing up in the Sioux, and, and certainly at a time uh, before hockey was a 12 month a year commitment, um, uh, my summers were uh, largely taken up playing baseball. And uh, Enrico Fado was, uh, a, a teammate of mine growing up and, and our fathers often coached together. So we would travel around Northern Ontario uh, playing competitive uh, baseball. And, uh, and we were, uh, you know, Rico, Rico was an incredible kind of all sport athlete. He was uh, a quick runner. He, I mean, at 12 years of age, he was throwing probably in the mid to high eighties as a Whoa. pitcher. Yeah. Whoa. He was, he was incredible. Uh, switch hitter, um and and uh, a really good third baseman as well with a, with a rocket of an arm um really if if hockey wasn't his real passion i think he might have had a chance in baseball and oh. we had some we had some kids and teammates back then who uh, realized that Sault Ste. Marie Ontario is not really a baseball hotbed <laughs> and so they yeah. um they moved down and went to high school in Texas even um, so, uh, but Rico and I, we, uh, we, together, we had a kind of an amateur look from the Atlanta Braves who would, uh, who would hold mini camps around Ontario. And we were invited to one of those, uh, in our younger years, to, uh, just to kind of get a look. And I mean, I was an, I was average, I was a junk ball pitcher. Rico would pitch the first four innings with his, with his heat. And I would come in for the last three innings with my, with my curve balls and, uh, <laughs> You know, and somehow we we made it through. But uh, but yeah, that was what we did in the in the Sioux uh, growing up when when hockey was out of season. You know, yeah. the skates went away. Yeah, the baseball fleets the came baseball on, and, and come yeah. So it was it was it was a it was a cool experience in that sense because I know today, uh, you know how serious hockey is and how serious competitive hockey is and how serious parents are. <laughs> uh, um, you know, it's uh, oftentimes kids are playing more hockey in the off season than they are in the hockey season. So yeah, really. um, it was a nice, it was a nice variety. Yeah. Uh, what point you did, uh, ho- you said hockey was kind of the focus sort of thing. Is it around the time that uh, scouts are kind of kind of starting to come around and uh, ask questions sort of thing that you kind of went, you know, let's go this hockey route. And I'm sure the, 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 the family Shirella was always happy to have the, the goaltender in the family too. Cause we all know how much parents love those. Yeah, my dad was heartbroken. I think uh, when, <laughs> when I saw, when I told him around the age of seven that I wanted to go, that's when you got. That's when you actually got to wear goalie gear. Was at the age of oh, seven. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. And uh, and and um, 
studies will show this is very official but studies will show that uh young children are most uh, are most interested in two things at hockey games the goaltenders and the zambonis and so, <laughs> <laughs> but for most of them that, that curiosity, I want to ride where zamboni came from yeah, yeah, yeah. for mo- most kids they'll they'll want to be a goalie they'll try it once they realize <laughs> it's pretty dumb and yeah. and they move on and they lose interest so I was uh, I was I was a prolific uh, six year old goal scorer, uh, <laughs> believe goal it or not, scorer. Oh, goal yeah. scorer. Yeah. And so when I told my dad uh, I wanted to try being a goaltender, he was uh, he was he was uh, dismayed. Um, but it was something that I tried, and something I, I was a good skater, so I was comfortable. I was comfortable on skates. Yeah. And and being in and around the goal crease is an awkward way to move. Um, yeah. And so I I, I excelled at it just because I was comfortable on skates. I was on skates from, you know, when I was two years old. So I, uh, I did that and it never in any way did that. You just born in skates, right? Yeah. Two years old. I've got pictures. Uh, I was, I was a little less lazy than my son seems to be at this point. But, <laughs> but uh, so it was, it was, it was, uh, yeah. I mean, around the zoo was unique because it's a small center and, but we would go to, Don Mills and we would go to Buffalo, New York and Syracuse, New York, and we would beat teams or be, be very competitive with teams um, and win these tournaments that were filled with teams from large centers. I mean, the Toronto uh, Marlies, the Toronto Red Wings, the Don Mills Flyers coming from these huge centers. uh, And we're coming from a town of 75,000 people with a pretty good nucleus of kids. And by the time I was in midget, I think, I think seven or eight of you know my midget teammates were drafted into the OHL. Yeah, which yeah. is pretty incredible considering yeah, the size is, of the city. As I said, three of them came down here. So we well, all three—that's three. Uh, that's, three of, that's just three of us on one team. Yeah, that's right. right on one know. team is pretty good. Donnie Carrillo was a hell of a scout. He was a good scout up there in the north. He had, uh, he had, uh, he had it covered. He had it covered, and he had it covered very well. And that's how he, he ended up with the three guys coming down here. Yeah, it's, it's fortunate uh, the way things work out. I'm, uh, you know, it's often said, uh, you know, uh, when uh, opportunities kind of when luck meets preparation. And uh, we were lucky and fortunate to have a guy like Donnie up in the Sioux uh, whose voice mattered to people, yeah. um, even outside of the Sioux. And uh, uh, and when he persuaded uh the brass of the London Knights to take. I mean, Rico was a no-brainer. He was a double underager who played oh, for the yeah. Sioux Greyhounds. He played for uh, Hounds. <laughs> and so, so the Knights took him with the first overall pick. And um, uh, I was fortunate that um, I was fortunate to get drafted at all. I thought, and it was a real privilege. Um, and just to be drafted by the Knights was uh, was exciting at the time too. So, yeah. we were we were pretty lucky kids. Uh, like I said, growing up from a smaller center to be surrounded by uh, other talented kids. And, and obviously, um, you know, people who knew their stuff that were calling the shots. Uh, can you tell us the story about your parents who used to drive to a certain location on a certain street and just to hear the games? Can you, can you recall yeah. that story? Yeah, this was before the time, obviously, of, uh, of um, Rogers uh, or, or, um, or, or, uh, or pod, not podcast, but webcasts, yep, webcast yep. games, and before the time of Sportsnet broadcasting games. Yep. Um, and so my parents somehow would be able, what was, what was it, AM 980? Yeah, yeah. Was That's that right. with Stubbs? So Mike Stubbs yep, was with yep, us. Yep, Stubbs was with us. And, and um, my parents, I don't know how they tuned in from the Sioux one time and just managed to get a faint re- reception of, uh-huh. of the game. And so they then that led to driving around uh, <laughs> Sault Ste. Marie, and they found this one. What, what's a tob- it's a tobogganing hill for the kids in the winter. Okay. And they were able to get to the top of the hill um, where the best reception could be uh, found, and they were able to listen to games. You know, some seven hundred kilometers away. <laughs> Did the policeman not stop them and say, "What are you doing here?" Uh, well, no, they had their they had their coffees, they, and they would they would I think they would meet with the mazukas and the fatas up there once in a while, and okay. uh, everybody knew the same hot spot to catch to catch us losing most of the time anyway. But <laughs> <laughs> well, not all the time. Yeah, but uh, so that's but that's what you had to do in those days. Otherwise, they were um, 
uh, you know, being the drive, what it was, it, they, they take the I-75 up through Michigan. Yeah. Um, oh, and it was, yeah. seven, you know, a good 700 kilometers, but uh, Ooh, they, would, yeah. they would leave um, work at noon on Fridays or take the day off and get to the ice house for a puck drop on a Friday yeah. night. Yeah, that was a, that was dedication to the cause. Believe now, I, I now Gino, that. That, the, you came, what, 96, 97? That's right, yeah. The year before yeah. wasn't that great. No, no, <laughs> no, no not at all. Eric, take us through that year before we let Gene go with the story, because for those who are of fandom, they don't rem- they they try or they may just choose to ignore ninety five ninety six. Yeah, that's that's the year that we went. To, I say we the Knights went three sixty and three three wins and three ties, and uh, I had open heart surgery. <laughs> <laughs> while it was going on. <laughs> As a matter of fact, the last game I saw before the surgery was a win, their first win. And then when I came back, uh, the, the, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the ties, my first game back was uh, one of the ties. And Brankley said, uh, hey, uh, Pete, you got you to gotta, you gotta stick around here. <laughs> we, uh, we like your presence. And, uh, but anyway, it, it was a fun year, uh, uh, although uh, uh, not, you, not a bad year to take on the DL there. No, right? that, that's what the, the coach told me at the time. That's a good good year to be on the DL. Now, Gino, it's, the team goes 360 and three. I know, I know your, your general, you know, your general demeanor and humor. Uh, you make reference to this all the time, but Why? <laughs> Hey, the wow. next year, uh, the, the, well, the 99 year, actually, is uh, he, he really uh, came into his own. He got the Knights to uh, almost, almost their first uh, OHL championship. Now, 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 why I wanted to come to London. <laughs> you, get, oh, you talked about hockey mm-hmm. parents and how particular they are about uh, wow. how's the team and where's the trend and all that sort of thing. Yeah, you, <laughs> I've I've got a bit of a beef about that, and and uh, maybe I'm old, and uh, but y- you know, to be drafted into the OHL uh, in a province the size of Ontario, and the number of kids that play hockey in Ontario, and in all seriousness, to be drafted in the OHL is quite what an accomplishment for any kid, whatever the round is, whatever the team is, what a privilege, um, and what a recognition of uh, your skill and your work and, uh, and your sacrifice, and your parents' sacrifice. And I, so, I mean, then back in the nineties, it wasn't really uh, a thing, you know, to manipulate <laughs> the draft or the teams and, and who the hell was I anyway. Right. <laughs> um, you know, Eric Lindros did it in the, in the early nineties. And coincidentally, he, he did it to Sault Ste. Marie where he didn't want to report uh, to Sault Ste. Marie and Sault Ste. Marie unloaded him to Oshawa for a boatload of picks and, and players and ended up going to three straight Memorial Cups and uh, winning winning their third try uh, on home ice. Um, but I mean, even then, Eric Lindros is a prodigy, right? Um, that doesn't make it right, um, yep. but it's just become so common now in more recent years where every 16-year-old kid's parents are are saying, well, you know, if the right team doesn't choose me or the team that I don't want to choose me, I'm going to college or you know, NCAA. Or, yeah. And they play that game. And, you know, I, I, the, the league has really done nothing to guard against that. And it, I think it really hurts some of the smaller market teams. Yeah. You know, the, the Sudbury's, the Sault Ste. Marie's, the Owen Sounds. Um, and I, I just don't like the, I don't like the look, uh, the look of, of a kid saying, you know, turning their nose up at any team because it yeah. is a, it's a privilege um, yeah, to be able to yeah. play at that level. And um, so when 1996, I wasn't about to turn my nose up at anybody. <laughs> Although, you know, I'd hope that the Greyhounds would have chosen me, uh, you know, sure. who, would, who wouldn't want to stay sure. home. And sure. the, the Greyhounds were rock stars in my youth. And um, but you know, uh, London chose me and my, you know, my, my, uh, my mindset really coming in was we couldn't do any worse than three games of 66. <laughs> and, um, and my, uh, that season we won 13 games the next season, the season, my, which is like a 400%. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> and it's a wonder how I didn't get drafted into the NHL after that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, terrible you, numbers. You, you remember that 99 year though i was that the highlight of your london stay oh yeah absolutely and uh and we didn't really have a team that 
we had a good team. Um, yeah, had a good team. And it's all about when you reach your potential and when you peak sort of thing. Yeah. But we, I think we went in November with, you know, 11 losses out of 12. We had a terrible stretch in, in the early part of the season, but a really, really talented nucleus of players. Um, and, uh, and, and, and then things just turned around. And Plymouth that year had really loaded up. Um, yeah, they had. Uh, they had, I think, honestly, they had five or six first round NHL picks on their team um, and some really, really good second round NHL picks on their team. Mm-hmm. Um, and we shocked them in the um, in the second round, I think it yep. was yep. Uh, at home, uh, their, their home in the their seventh home. game. And we had we had three or four coach buses of London Knights fans yeah. who, 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 who mobilized and organized and got to Plymouth. And they were the only people in the rink. Yeah, that's <laughs> so true. We had the home ice advantage. In, uh, in my this, wife went to that arena. game. My wife went to that final game, and and she said, "Oh my God, they've scored!" There was this big roar out of the crowd uh, early. They they were late getting to the game, and uh, because they didn't know where the rink was. Uh, but uh, it was our game. We'd scored. Yeah, there was more people from London there than there were from Plymouth, and the. Uh, and we we scored, so that was a pleasant surprise for them. I remember before the game, uh, we were unaware of this in the dressing room, but Plymouth was a new arena, lacked a bit of character, white walls everywhere. It was very sanitary looking. Yeah. Um, uh, and we were in the dressing room getting dressed, and uh, you could hear just rowdiness coming from the, the arena, right? Uh, and we just, why wouldn't you assume it's the hometown fans, hometown, of course, right? you know. So I po- I was dressed and I took my jersey and I poke my head out the cutway and I see just a, a wave of London Knights fans um, really looped in back around their goaltender around their yes, net. That's and, right. And and they as it was then the home team went on the ice for an extra five minute warm up I think so mm-hmm. they got twenty minutes where we get fifteen so for that first five minutes of their warm up the noise was that our fans were cheering every time a puck went into past. Plymouth's own goalie. <laughs> yeah, and he had rabbit ears. That kid, I remember. And he, had and he was ears. getting he was getting rattled that his teammates were scoring on him in warmups because yep. of this throng of London fans <laughs> going berserk every time a puck went in in warmups. And we we killed them. It was like nine two by the end of that game. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, it was, it was, yeah. Uh, but they had a really talented. So that was what kind of set us off. Uh, uh, you know, um, on our path, in, in it was a kind of a Cinderella run. You know, not expected, but. Uh, very welcome and very exciting, you know, for us and for the fans. And then when you got to the final against Belleville, uh, they uh, they were up three three games to one. That's right, and, yeah. And then you won games five and six to force yeah. a game seven. And yeah. uh, uh, that, that Yardman Arena in Belleville, they held the uh, home ice advantage. It was just a, it was a zoo. Uh, we were trying to do the broadcast. Lee Cunningham and I were trying to do the really? broadcast. And uh, it was amazing the, how we were drowned out by the sound. We, we were really uh, hard pressed to get our, uh, and they scored early on that on that game. They sc- yeah. and, and won it, and and uh, I know it was very they, emotional for the guys when you're when you were over. When they, they scored. Er- they scored early and often. Yeah, they did. Yeah, they won nine two. You, it's good. It's easy for you to say, not for me. No, well, yeah. I mean, they could nine. have won three two. They still won, but they they had a what a crazy uh, rink that was. And right over my right shoulder was a big bull head yeah. on the wall, yep. and its nostrils would spew smoke, and its yeah. eyes would light up every time they scored. I yeah. think the red. I think the red eyeballs burnt out by the end of that game. <laughs> On, and they ran out of dry ice, out of dry ice to throw out. Right. <laughs> but I think that game, I think there was a brawl in the stands. I think my dad might have been in it. Uh, Mr. Jay Legault's dad, you know, Mr. Kostopoulos was there. Uh, oh yeah. Um, some, some of our fans, re- it got really rowdy. But um, yeah, they they took it to us. I think that game, I single handedly put Jonathan Chichu into the NHL. I think he scored ah. five. He scored five He's, goals on me just yes, that game. Yeah, he did. I'm, again, it's easy for you to say. I'm glad you brought it up, not uh, me. Yeah, you know what? It's, but it was a good series. It was. It was a good series. They were. They. They thought. They thought they were going to beat you in four straight. 
yeah. before it began. They thought, you know, you know, it was unfortunate. I felt for Belleville about that, the way that uh, you know ended ultimately in the Memorial Cup. Ottawa hosted the Memorial Cup. Yeah, did. And, and and I think they lost Ottawa might have lost out in the first or second round of the playoffs. And so they had like 40 days off yep. to, to, to practice and to heal and to rest. Uh, and Belleville comes out of a, a war of a series mm-hmm. with us and having gone four rounds in the playoffs, seven games against us, there's you and like you win. And then the next day you're off on a bus to yeah, Ottawa right. to, to Ottawa. play the Memorial Cup. Yep. Um, yep. And so I think if I remember in that Memorial Cup, uh, uh, Belleville lost, they might've lost Justin Papineau, who was, who was their high oh, scorer, yeah. you yeah. know, um, and, yeah. and Ottawa ended up winning the tournament uh, yeah. uh, ultimately as the host team. But, uh, but yeah, no, it was, a, it was a good season and it was, it was a, just a real surprise and the enthusiasm, I mean, the London Knights fans, that core of fans, even through some of the lean years were just starving for, uh, for some success. And they really, the excitement was, uh, was incredible. Um, the the lineups at the box office just to get tickets was down outside the, uh, it would, it would go outside the parking lot and down the fence all the way to Wellington road, just for lineups to to, to get tickets to the next game. It was pretty cool. Yeah. Now, Gino, it, it, Pete was bringing up a story beforehand, which I, I, you and I have reminisced because actually you brought up this story to me while we were doing a Nationals game once. I think you, you said, I've got a video to show you in the intermission. Just hold on. We'll, we'll get it to, we'll get there. Uh, somebody had emailed or sent you a text with, hey, I found this clip on YouTube and it became one of my favorite Gene Chirillo stories. And it just so happened that Pete actually brought up the, the, the second half of this. And then I realized before we started recording this would be the throwing of the blocker story. Um, you know, there, there's all the, the great memories of, uh, you know, uh, the run against Belleville and, you know, taking things up every year with wins. But take us through this story of, uh, you know, we, we've seen uh, we've seen a couple goalie fights in, in history. We've seen, uh, you know, there may have been some equipment uh, tossed here and there, but uh, you had and I'll see if YouTube won't, you know, sue me for you using this. If I can find it, I might add it into the video afterwards. Oh, but, yeah, do it. Uh, <laughs> you, you decide it, you got to take us through this story because it was just uh, it's, it's Gino, a blocker and a guy he wasn't too happy with. <laughs> yeah, you'll, you'll want to Google or YouTube, but Peterborough, London Knights, uh, you know, uh, 20 or 19, I guess it was 20. 2000 by that yeah, point yeah, 20 years yeah. ago now um yeah so we were playing against peterborough peterborough had uh, i think they had three of the top five penalty minute leaders in the league but they were a good team and those penalty minute leaders were were, were legit hockey players um uh and we were we were not we were math in london we were mathematically already eliminated from the playoffs so uh that could have been like any time in january um, <laughs> but um we're, it was near the end of the season, uh, and I, I know that because the, the young fella's suspension carried on into the playoffs. So um, we uh, we were playing against Peterborough at home. Uh, we, by some act of God, we were uh, we were winning, um, and there was uh, an extra enthusiasm about the rink because on this particular night, every time we scored a goal, uh, I forget who was sponsoring the night, but a, a, fan, a London Knights fan would be uh, awarded a TV. And so uh, yours truly, Pete James, was not in the press box that, for this game, but he was on a wireless mic making his way about the, uh, you know, the bleachers and yeah. inter- interviewing fans. And we scored five goals by the end of this one. I think it was five. And mm-hmm. so there was a lot of excitement, a lot of buzz. And, uh, of course, on top of that, we're going to win the game. Um, and so uh, Peter Burrow was in some nasty, nasty mood. And as they dumped the puck into our end to finish the game off, I just went out behind the net to stop the puck. Oftentimes, I would, if the puck came to me at the end of the game, I would keep the puck and wrap tape around it and note the date and the score. Um, and I've got a bucket of pucks like that in my basement now. But yeah. So I stopped the puck behind the net. I came around the net uh, to get back into my crease. And as I approached uh, the goal line again, I just got smushed. Like, I, I mean, I got lambasted yeah. uh, by, and and I didn't hear but people were yelling at me warning me look out look out look out um, and I, I like I say um, I was on the goal line and I was hit so hard I like I, I hit the boards in the air I was airborne yeah. 
yeah, yeah. Um, for a, like eight feet. Um, and I just fell into a pile into the boards and I, I don't know what happened. So I, I get up um, and uh, our, so Bob Crummer, who was the guy who, yep. who hit me, um, was on the ice beside me. I, I shook my, I shake my head like what just happened here? Cause you don't expect it. And then our rookie defenseman, Bobby Turner jumped on to Bob Crummer and started wailing away. So now I'm putting it together in the moment. I'm saying, okay, obviously this guy just ran me because why else would this be happening? So I got up and started throwing my punches and getting my blocker in there. And, uh, and, and so a brawl erupts and, their coach had planned for this. And so he put all of their tough, tough customers on the ice for the, for the face off yep. that preceded this. And our coach of course did not expect it because who would. So we had uh, a Slovak, a Czech <laughs> and two rookie <laughs> and two rookies who didn't know what to think of it. Um, and Bobby Turner was a rookie too, but he could really handle himself. Uh, um, and so as the linesman comes to pull me off of uh, the top of this pile, uh, um, he was pulling me away all the while, whispering in my ear, you know, keep throwing the punches because, <laughs> not, because that was garbage. And uh, as he pulled me away, I, I managed to throw my, like physically throw my blocker uh, into the pile. It, it's a pretty good, it's a pretty good scene. Uh, so I, I went back, they, they got me off the ice. I went back to the dressing room and I think I took off my Jersey and my chest protector yep. and I, I had a, cut off sleeve shirt on and I was I was pretty you know I worked out they I, I, I there was no shortage of biceps on this guy yeah, yeah, yeah. so I went back out on the I think I was back out on the ice somehow and I don't even it was just it was chaos and uh, uh but yeah so that 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 young fellow at that point I think got a 16 or 17 game suspension which uh effectively ended his OHL career because it was at the end of his uh his eligibility mm-hmm yeah, it was it was quite a night. I remember it well. I remember it well. Uh, Bobby Kramer running you, and uh, and and and, and the, what followed, what ensued, and it wasn't. As you were reminiscing, I believe I found the game sheet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not February, the video. February eleventh uh, of of uh, two thousand, I believe, is the uh, mainly because the the, uh, the 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 penalty sheet starts. At uh, you know the, basically the, the 1926 of the third period, and yeah. then it's well filled out from there. And yeah. Uh, yeah. there's uh, there, there's a few uh, looks like uh, might have been Adam Dewan. He there was, was a instigator fighting, couple of game misconducts in there. Crummer's got his fighting and match penalty. Uh, I and think then, there was a guy named McCurcher as well. Maybe is he on there? Got to look here. Uh, Steve Montador was in there for fighting. Oh. Montador had five, and then Matt, uh, her, no, her nice, and I don't know, I'm going to butcher that, but uh, the, the print's too small. Um, yeah. But yeah, it, it, it starts, and it's uh, it's quite uh, quite fulfilled there as well. <laughs> yeah, four, four of our guys on the ice at that point were deer in the headlights. Like, the, I mean, Steve Montador was a tough, tough customer, even in the NHL, obviously. Um, uh, and, and again, they had a, they had a lineup of really tough guys. So I, we heard from fans afterwards. And if you see the video on YouTube, there's a brawl, hey, there's a skirmish behind the Peterborough bench because one of the fans back there told me after the game that he heard the coach give kind of give the order to the players. Like, this is what you got to do. Like yeah. given, given, given the code red, the few good yeah. men, mm. <laughs> but so, so there was a, there was a fight behind the, the Peterborough bench. And it was one of our fans and you, you could see security trying to intervene. But I think that fan was the guy who told me, you know, I heard the coach tell them to do that. So it was, it seemed pretty premeditated. Um, but, uh, but yeah, good, good memories. Uh, you know, Good way to end. Uh, good way to end the OHL career. And if, if it was early February and we were we were mathematically eliminated from the playoffs, well, I guess that's a little taste of uh, <laughs> what the ninety, what being in on the nights in the nineties was like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Except for 99, 98, 99. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, then obviously you finish out the junior career. Uh, you're, you're sporting the UNB hat proudly. I know uh, a proud member of uh, of the, the a well documented hockey program sort of thing. Take us through that decision, and um, you know how obviously how things went to making the way out to the East Coast. Yeah, um, when I was finishing my 20 year old year in London, uh, Columbus Blue Jackets had just 
uh, gotten a team in the NHL. They hadn't had their first season yet. And at the conclusion of that year, now my agent was a former knight named Mark Guy, who was well known in hockey circles mm-hmm. and uh, Newport Sports. Um, um, and uh, actually, just learned that Mark uh, got out of the business, is doing something totally different now. Um, oh, really? Oh, yeah. yeah. So, so Mark was uh, he was he was excellent, and uh, he was uh, my representative. He got me a free agent tryout with the Columbus Blue Jackets, um, and, and I I was pretty happy with you know with my. OHL career on the whole, um, you know, you could always done better, but I was happy um, with how things turned out and the circumstances. And so I got an, a free agent trial with Columbus and uh, Gary Agnew, our, our coach for London had just been named um, um, Columbus's affiliate coach, the Syracuse crunch. He was named yeah. their head coach. Yep. Uh, and, and Gary and I had a great relationship and uh, he was, he was an excellent coach and a great person i thought um, yes he was yes yeah he was. quality person um and so uh columbus is one of columbus's scouts i don't know if he was their head amateur scout or what he was it was a fellow by the name of don boyd who was yeah. i believe was also a london guy like, yes I think he, he was, was yeah right sure, sure. Uh, and he, he was affiliated he was affiliated with the, the sue greyhounds in the 80s um uh-huh. uh, and so uh i thought yeah. all the stars were kind of aligning you know here i am coming off a you know, pretty good OHL career. Yep. Um, and here's a, a fledgling NHL franchise with really no depth chart whatsoever because uh-huh. they're starting. They're just starting out. Um, my head coach is the head coach now of their uh, AHL affiliate. Um, their head scout or somebody who's high up in their scouting is a lo- local London guy. Yep. Um, yes. And uh, so I went to training camp and training camp. Uh, then I believe we were in Traverse City, Michigan. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They were, we were in Traverse City, Michigan for a mini, mini tournament. That's only two hours away from my parents' place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So my parents met us there and, uh, um, you know, we played and my, my dad, too, uh, my dad was kind of the, 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 the speedometer for me. If he said, he was honest, right. Uh, if he said I played well, I played well. And if I didn't, well, <laughs> he wasn't going to blow smoke, you know, where the sun didn't shine. So, um, <laughs> so I, I did, I played well as, as I could and I was happy with the training camp, but, uh, they had other things in mind, but uh, so they they essentially uh, you know cut from training camp after some time and uh, and told to to move on. We'll we'll keep our eye out for you. Yeah, okay, <laughs> I'll wait yeah. by the phone for you. You know, uh-huh. um, so uh, that entire summer leading up, I was recruited uh, by you know kind of courted by a number of Canadian university teams, um, most of them from the east coast of Canada, uh, and so I was. Uh, making my decision over the summer months before attending an HL training camp, I was, you know, there was a lot of, a lot of interest, but I was always of the mind of, you know, I had the, the blinders on I'm not going to play university hockey. I'm going to be in the NHL, obviously. Like why, you know, I had this one track sort of thinking, which you kind of have to um, uh, have at that point in your career when you're trying to make a, a career out of it. And so uh, you and the University of New Brunswick's coach called me, and he was a guy from PEI uh, who had all sorts of connections with people from PEI in and around the hockey world. Yeah. And uh, he called me every single day. He had just got the job. He hadn't wow. coached the UNB yet. He just got the job. And he called me every day, pressing me for my answer, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And he, 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 re- he was really interested. So he, and his name is he's, he's a good friend of mine and he still coaches UNB. His name's Gardner McDougall. And he would call me and every day he'd say, hi, uh, Gene, yeah, Gardner McDougall calling UNB hockey. And I, by <laughs> like, like two months into it, I finally, like, yeah, you don't have to introduce yourself anymore. You know, I know talk to you are. more than I talk to my dad. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so uh, have you uh, made your decision yet? And finally I just said, okay, I will come to UNB you know, uh, all the while thinking that I was never going to go to UNB or any university because I was going to be famous and wealthy, right? Um, and I, <laughs> I had already had my Mustang convertible picked out or whatever, us oh, Italians yeah. drive, you know. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, so when uh, the news came down in uh, Columbus, when they said, you know, we've got our goalies already for our, for our affiliate team and all and so on. Uh, you know, we're not going to take you. Uh, you know, I, I knew I didn't want to play minor professionally for 500 bucks a week. And 
you know, 27 weeks a year, yep. you know, yep. you're, you're still, you're still holding down a summer job, you know? Yep. Uh, and, and so I didn't like, I didn't like the game that much to take that sort of uh, risk with anything. So get on with I, the career. Yeah. So I, I went to UNV and, um, you know, it was, it was a good decision. Uh, uh, it, it was a difficult transition to, you know, concentrate on uh, the academic portion as well as it was very serious hockey. I mean, uh, we, we, we played uh, exhibition games against the St. John flames, uh, mm. the age, and we tied them and we beat them. I mean, it was, mm. you know, good, good hot. We'd go down to the Eastern uh, United States, uh, the Boston college, Harvard and, and, and tie or beat them or lose by a goal. Yeah. So it was, a, it was a great brand of hockey. And, uh, and uh, what made you choose law? Oh God. <laughs> oh, I tried my hand at teaching for a short time Yeah, <laughs> and realized yeah. that some of these kids were going to need lawyers before they were going to need professors. So <laughs> I, <laughs> I, uh, so I, I went to teach, I went, I did my undergrad at UNB. Of course I had a bit of a speed bump with uh, the health issues um, and graduated there from there, went to teacher's college in North Bay for a year, and then went back to UNB to study law for three years, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. following in Mazuka's footsteps. Of course, he was yeah. already studying there law. You go. And, there uh, you go. So he was my, my mentor at the time. Yeah. You, you mentioned, and you, you kind of skipped right over uh, a, a significant portion there, Gino, and that was, a, you called it a speed bump, uh, <laughs> health related oh. matters. Uh, Pete, uh, Pete, I'll, I'll let you take the, the start of this story. And then, wow. uh, and then, uh, obviously this was a, this was a, a community outreach that went far and wide. You, you were coming down to London to the golf tournament, the team golf tournament, were you not? When you had to cover your hand with the, your yeah. eye with your hand, maybe you can pick it up. Yeah. I, there, yeah. But... I woke up one morning. Yeah, I, I, I woke up one morning up in the Sioux. We had uh, celebrated my parents' 25th wedding anniversary, and I got a little too enthusiastic with uh, the homemade uh, vino. And <laughs> no, contrary to co contrary to what people joke about, it can make you go blind. <laughs> because <laughs> I, I, I mean, I woke up the next morning uh, and I, I was cross-eyed. I was literally cross-eyed. My, my right eye was turned into my nose. Um, and so, uh, I had a number of uh, tests and whatnot to, to decipher what this was. And, uh, in the midst of this, the, the London Knights alumni golf tournament was going on. So I, I drove to London and I, I, because I was cross-eyed and seeing double images everywhere, yeah. I, I had to drive down the I-75 covering my right eye. <laughs> six, so I, I basically drove like this for six hours. Oh you know, boy. Just, you know, um, well, I got to the golf tournament, uh, of course, didn't golf particularly well because I'm not a particularly good golfer. Um, and my excuse was, well, I'm seeing, I have double blurred vision, you know, everybody's yeah. joking, like, yeah, sure. Good, good, a good one, a good excuse. Um, uh, but when I got home from that, uh, that golf tournament, I had an MRI and it came back and I had a brain tumor on my, on my brain stem, um, uh, which was, uh, that would have been, you know, August, and by September, I had a brain surgery to remove it. Um, and they went up my nose with a scope. And uh, and the, the doctor of the day then said, you know, my nose was big enough that he could have used a garden hose and a hammer and a chisel. Uh, <laughs> but he was he was also Italian, so he could make that joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, so, uh, so that was successful, um, this brain surgery. And uh, I went back to the Sioux from Toronto to recover. And about six weeks later, I saw and the, the pathology came back on the tumor, indicating that it was a cancerous tumor, which was alarming. But I always said, you know, well, good thing it's no longer in my head, right? Um, I mean, it's it's alarming to hear that, but good thing they took it out, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah. so I, I saw an oncologist for kind of what I thought was precautionary sort of measures um, subsequent to uh, finding out that news. And the MRI that he took that particular day, six weeks later, uh, indicated that it had grown back and it was larger than it was before. Although it wasn't affecting, I didn't have any symptoms, wasn't affecting my vision or anything. Um, and so he, the, he, the, the turning point was, <laughs> he said, uh, you know, there's nothing I can do to help you uh, go back to Sault Ste. Marie and, and get palliative care. Wow. And I, did, I didn't know, as I was 23, I didn't know what palliative care meant. 
and I was just really excited that we had palliative care in the Sioux because I could, <laughs> I, was, I didn't know what, like, so I was like, you can't get your tonsils out in the Sioux no. like, until a doctor comes from Toronto to do it at that time. Yeah. I'm like, oh, we have palliative care in the Sioux. Perfect. We'll do that. Yeah. And I didn't know what that even meant. And, yeah. Uh, finally, I got the message. It's like, just go home and make sure you're comfortable while you have you're, a good while, time. Yeah. While you, while you die and get your things in order. Right. Yeah, you're, but your mother stepped in here. Did well, she I, I stepped in. I kind of, I, I think I grabbed the doctor by the lab coat and uh, sh shocked him a bit. And I said, you know, uh, we got to do something. It doesn't matter what you do. And um, my parents were there with me too. It was, it was a, you know, it was a, sh a shocking sort of, I don't even know there's words for it. Just yeah, well, a real yeah. shocking moment in time. Yeah, you know? Yes, it was. Yeah, it would stop the clock. Yeah. And so uh, he said, you know, I can treat you maybe you know, treat you, um, but it won't help. And, you know, you're going to be um, not in a comfortable way. You're going to be very sick. And this is how you want to live it out. And I, I just thought, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to go down looking, we're going to go down swinging, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he agreed to treat me. And by the six, end of six months of, uh, of treatment, um, and for a six month period, like, you know, uh, Pete, you kind of alluded to, I, such an outreach of support and, um, and, and goodwill from the hockey community and yeah. just the communities at large, you know, basically London and Sault Ste. Marie and Fredericton, New Brunswick, incredible support and, and, and just a real morale boost, uh, for, for a guy like me. Um, and it was a year that the NHL was on strike. And so there weren't oh, okay. a lot of, there weren't a lot of hot, it wasn't a lot of hockey news out there. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so um, this was a story, it was a story, you know, and, uh, and so I, the, the emails that I got, man, ranging from the people that I never met and across no, the hockey no. world, that's really, um, really indicative of, uh, you know, the, 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 the fraternity of the hockey people, the, the community, the, um, uh, you know, the, just the representative of the, the, the good, the, the real yeah. good that comes yeah. out of being involved in a sport like that. Yep. So after six months, uh, the tumor had uh, essentially been, uh, I don't know, you know, killed, not yeah. shrunk, not shrunken or or gone altogether. It was, but yeah. it, it turned into dead tissue. Yeah, and I had to have a second brain surgery to uh, to remove that uh, that mass, and that was the end. It was a it was a scope of time of just twelve months, which seems like a long time, but um, is is a short is a narrow scope compared to what some people in similar circumstances deal with for years yeah. and years and years. Yeah. 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 Very fortunate. That turned out well. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah. My nose doesn't look a hell of a lot better. But <laughs> you win some, I, you lose some. <laughs> I can say that because I'm married to an attack. <laughs> Oh man, it's uh, it, it, the other the other thing too, Gino. And I gotta, I just uh, as I, as reminisce, I just you know start searching things and so on and so forth. Uh, we know you had the the, the eggplant and teal phase of the London Knights. Then you go to UNB and get the the red and black. And I pull up a photo, and I see that you've got a red and white pad and a black and white pad. Are you throwing off the the goaltender scheme in general here, or is this just a as we know your personality, uh, you like to mix it up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I like to do. I was doing something. My coach saw those when they. Uh, you, our coach Gardner was uh, very, very. He was pretty serious. So I'm in, in and around the rink, serious guy. And he saw these pads come in. He was the first one to see them because I was in class. And he calls me to his office. Like I get to the rink, my pads are there. I haven't seen them, and my 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 number is on the whiteboard indicating the coach wants to see me in his office, which was not an uncommon thing. So I go into his office and he closed the door. He goes, yeah, um, your, uh, your pads uh, showed up. Uh, I think there's a problem. Oh, what's that? Well, they sent you one red one and then they sent you one black one. I said, oh, that's exactly how I heard them. <laughs> there it is. So, there, it so, is. Yeah. there it is. So somewhere out there, there's another red one and another black one. I said, yeah. yeah, but I don't care about that. This is the way I want. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they didn't see too much rubber because uh, I, if I was playing, I didn't stop many pucks anyway. So hey. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, but it was fun. You know, it was uh, playing out at UMB was, was an awesome, uh, fun, uh, and a kind of an experience that escalated in the way I appreciated it. The first year I was there, I, you know, it was kind of 
depressed about it, you know, uh, coming from the excitement of being yep. in the OHL and, and the, yep. the, pin, the excitement of being at an NHL training camp and yep. what that might have turned into. And then you're in Canadian University Hockey and there's not a lot of fanfare. There's not a lot of, uh, nobody follows you. It's not yep. them. I, I speak in terms of back then. Um, but uh, to wrap to wrap up the story of, of my kind of my... Uh, my, my health uh, challenges. When I came back the year after, uh, I had surgery in July of 2004, yeah, 2004, um, and uh, that was in July. And I came, I came to training camp in at UNB in August, like thir- like 30 or 45 days after my brain surgery. Yeah. And and the coach was like, "You can't participate. I don't want." anything on my hands about this, <laughs> uh, you know? And so I, I was, I was terribly out of uh, shape. You know, I was laying in a bed for 12 months um, and eating and eating egg McMuffins. Uh, and so I, I, you know, I, I, I came to training camp. I came onto the team as the backup goalie, which was great. And he let me play my first game in October following training. So I think it was something like October 6th or something. Um, and, uh, and and we won. We I, I played the game. And we won the game three or four two or something like that. Um, and there was and this exhibition game. There were like there were fans at it, which was unusual to have many fans at the game because, yeah. like I said, there wasn't there was just a lot of excitement around us then. And I I didn't know why there were I didn't didn't register to me why there were so many fans, but people knew because it was in the news that I was going to be playing and that was kind of the represented the comeback from this sure. tumultuous year and and the, the community of Fredericton the people of Fredericton all came out to to watch and support and it was it was a pretty cool experience just for an exhibition game which yeah. was probably the last meaningful hockey game I ever played but um, it was uh, it was a it was a really neat way to wrap it up. Yep, you bet. Yeah. We uh, yeah, there's the the story in general is is incredible. So I know it's one of those times where we we anytime Gene and I get together, there's usually a joke or two flying around. So I figured I'm like it's going to be different for me to, to sit and have a, a serious conversation. With <laughs> oh, we keep it light. We keep it light. Uh, uh, the only way to leave, always leave them laughing. Yeah, right. <laughs> Um, and then obviously now, Gino, uh, take us through after university time, uh, obviously you said you go through law, you've, uh, you've been a few places now, uh, kind of what's, what's today's life like for, for Gino? Yes. I, I mean, I've, I've been home since March. <laughs> We're watching the kids and, uh, now my wife works at the hospital. Uh, so she's oh, not know. been home since March. Um, nothing's as far as work wise, it's really changed for her schedule, but, um, uh, so I, I, I worked at a, a local law firm in London for a number of years and uh, moved on from there. Now I work as a, as an in-house lawyer for a, a robotics and engineering company, um, uh, that's based out of London and we have 15 offices across North America and I, uh, I work as their, uh, their general uh, legal counsel. And, uh, I also keep a foot in the private, uh, law practice ring with my old buddy, Mizuka. He's, uh. He's uh, he's got his own law firm downtown Toronto. He's uh, yep. uh, he's uh, obviously a, an excellent lawyer and a, a real smart guy. And so I I practice on the side through his law firm too when I've got a few minutes. So say hello to Mike for me. Yeah. So I'm, I'm fortunate. It's the best of kind of both worlds for me, and the fortunate really to be able to operate from my dining room table when I need to. So and uh, Rico, when you're back home in the Sioux, Rico's got two Tim Hortons, I understand. Oh yeah. My, now my dad and, and Quinto Mazuka, Michael's dad, Yeah. Uh, they, they meet weekly at uh, one of, or both of the Rico fat is Tim Hortons to, uh, uh, you know, to, to drink coffee and eat Timbits. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and Rico's Rico's there. He's, he's, uh, they see him. So, uh, if if I don't pass along uh, your greetings, uh, my my dad will. They will, yeah. But uh, but he's doing well too. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Well, uh, Peter, I, uh, we said we would keep Gene for at least under an hour, and we know when it comes to lawyers, we do not want to, uh, you know, go beyond that. Because, uh, we'll be getting the bill. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, it, 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 and Pete, I got to go to you. We've said a few Gene stories here. Is there any of that we've missed that you uh, you enjoyed from uh, yeah. his time or anything along the way? No, no, just uh, that 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 uh, ninety nine season sticks out uh, in in my mind. Because I'll tell you what they used to do. 
uh, because Belleville is the only rink in the OHL that has the big ice, Gary mm-hmm. would take the team to Woodstock, which has yeah. the big ice. And uh, they practice there, then get back on the bus and go down to Belleville. So it, it was uh, rather unique. Uh, the only two rinks with the m- major ice, uh, the Olympic ice, they call it, uh, it was in Belleville and, uh, and uh, Woodstock. So the way it went. That's true. We, uh, we would practice at Woodstock. Now, B- uh, Belleville had the long rink, but also had these really awkward corners. Yeah. That were almost square-like. and uh, Like Peterborough um, a little bit. Peterborough was even worse, but Belleville was similar, but it had the larger ice surface. So yeah. it was, uh, it was, yeah, it was a challenge, but uh, 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 overall, you know, great memories, of course, from, uh, from my years in the, in the OHL with London and um, uh, obviously great. I always say great relationships because um, the number of people that I still have relationships and talk to, to this day, you know, fans, even just fans, you know, like yeah. not, not even, not even teammates, but um, uh I don't know, Pete, if you'd remember Grandma May, who's, who used to sit behind the goalie, the goal net. Uh, she, she, she passed away last year at 90, oh gosh, I think she was 95 or 96 years old. Um, and she sat behind my net at the ice house and, and then in the, new, in the new arena sat behind the ninth net as well. Uh-huh. Um, but I mean, she was a lady who identified herself as my grandmother. <laughs> and everybody she, she would wear my jersey everybody thought she was my grandmother and uh maybe she was at my wedding too sat, sitting with my actual grandmothers and, yeah uh, yeah yep. uh, and you know people like that or sue taylor as well who was yeah. a, a big part of the booster club um and uh she was she was uh she was a good friend and, and met my kids and um you know so so great memories and, and very thankful for the relationships that and that's what I, you I, I've made and i've kept Sports is all about is, is good relationships. I mean, the yeah. stories uh, are, are there, and the, but they fade in the, you know, in the history, but the friendships don't, you know, they don't, that's right. they don't yeah. fade at all. Yep. And that's the good thing about it. And Very I'm true. still trying to figure out how I was lucky enough to call <laughs> hockey broadcast with both of you, because somehow I, I, I've told the story of my, in my parents, my, my parents' house, I actually won the Pete James sports broadcast <laughs> award when i was at fanshawe my mom loves telling the story of the fact that i was just over the moon because i was like oh, this is pete james like i'm winning this pete james sports. I, the best part was i told pete the first time and he goes oh yeah i think i remember something like that yeah, I do. I do, <laughs> I do. You know, somehow i just messaged gene on a whim after we did the one memorial cup show and i said hey we might need a color commentator for the junior b games thinking in full honesty there's no way that this guy's gonna say yes because he's like why am I going to go spend Wednesday night at the Western Fair with this idiot who just co- yip yaps for two hours? All of a sudden, I message him one day, hey, uh, any uh, any chance figuring I get, oh, yeah, things are busy. I'm like, he's a lawyer and everything like that. Yeah, sure, I'll come. And I was like, huh? <laughs> well, one, Wednesday nights were slow. And two, when you have three kids at home. <laughs> at the time, it was two. I believe the third yeah. one was the end of the broadcast yeah. career. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the, you you need a, you need a reason to get out of the house, and you can only go to Home Depot so many times. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it was uh, it was crazy times. But Gino, uh, thank you for this. We're just under the hour, so n- no need for extra billing. Um, consultation. Yeah. I was gonna say because if you need to bill somebody up here, um, <laughs> oh, no, we no, all no. know how well that billing period will go. <laughs> Thanks a uh, lot, Gino. It's good talking to you, Gino. It's, say hello to your mother and father for me. Well, thanks for having me, guys, and uh, and Happy New Year as well. You bet. You, you know, we'll okay. talk to you soon. And uh, once this all gets over with, I think there might be, uh, I believe if you recall correctly, you sent me a picture of, uh, I believe, a spread that was around the holidays once. I think we might need to have one of those. A cured, a cured meat party, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, oh, it was yeah. an event. And friends, if you haven't seen it before, we'll try and post it on the uh, Facebook page too. Uh, got it. Just so you can see exactly what a... And I think this was like a Saturday. It wasn't really like a holiday period. It's just Gene was like, here, I was up in the Sioux. My that mom my, made this. Oh, no, that was my grandmother. That was my grandmother's house. And there was not an animal spared. I mean, there was, <laughs> there was, there, there was everything from Noah's Ark on that table. Uh, you know, from fish to pork to beef to, you know, just 
Uh, and she eats none of it, but she just likes to make it and watch people pig out. So uh, <laughs> wow. I, I thought at, at the time, I thought, look at that. You know who would really like this would be Ryan. Because I've always talked about what this looks like and and he's got to know that it is actually true yeah it, it, exactly. it exists and uh and gino just on a parting note this episode brought to you by Krispy Kreme donuts <laughs> exactly <laughs> a couple references to those in the london nationals broadcast free advertising gentlemen this has been a lot of fun thanks so much thank you Bye.